Welcome to today's program of Ascend Life on the Autism Spectrum. I'm Keith Halperin. And I'm Will Burnick. And today our program is on the National Council on Severe Autism. And our guests are Jill Escher, uh, President of the uh, National Council of Severe Autism, and Sophie Escher. But before we begin, what's with your shirt this time, Will? Funny you should ask. This week's shirt is, is my Ascend shirt. I'm represent. It represents our group. Our group as ascend itself. It this year is ascend's twentieth anniversary. I we has been go, going on for that long, and we're we're celebrate celebrate and ascend is celebrating its twentieth anniversary. Excellent, and there'll be more about that upcoming, folks. Um, would you like to begin with our guests, Will? Gladly. Jill? Hey, Will. Good to see you again. You too. It's, it, it's been a long time. Tell us about the National, tell us about the National Council about, tell us about the National Council of, on Severe Autism. Sure. Um, the National Council on Severe Autism is a new nonprofit. It launched in January of this year. Um, that was created to help represent the voice and the interests of families affected by more severe forms of autism. Mm -hmm. So you might say, well, what does that mean, right? Well, autism, as we know, um, has a lot under its umbrella, a lot of different um, levels of functioning, a lot of different needs, a lot of diff different presentations, a lot of comorbidities. We, we all know mm -hmm. that. And Ascend, your shirt, <laughs> your organization, um, represents somewhat kind of the, mm. the higher functioning end of that spectrum where people tend to have language and be a little bit more functionally capable. And the National Council on Severe mm. Autism um, is focused more on the other end of the spectrum, those who tend to be a little bit uh, more challenged, nonverbal. They also often have um, severe behaviors and comorbidities um, that are less frequently present um, in other parts of the spectrum. So uh, my feeling is that um, all people with autism need a lot of understanding and a lot of representation um, and a lot of support, but that the needs can be very different mm -hmm. among the subgroups. Tell us about your background on the autism community. Sure, Will. Um, well, I'm a mom, first and foremost, and I have two kids with nonverbal forms of autism. And Sophie, who's here with me today, is one of them. I also have a son who is almost 21 years old, um, who is, is also a nonverbal form of autism. Um, but he also has much more severe behaviors um, than, than does his sister. Um, and, um, you know, it's my concern about them and my love for them that drew me into the advocacy part of the community. So I'm president of the Autism Society San Francisco Bay Area, right? That's why I was here um, before and I'll be talking about that more soon. President of National Council on Severe Autism. I also am very involved in autism research and um, I've done a lot in terms of providing community events for individuals and families affected by autism. Tell us about some of, some of the events on the council. Sure. Well, our biggest event every year, oh, the council, I'm sorry, the council, you're right. So the National Council on Severe Autism um, is um, an organization that really tries to promote awareness of the challenges that are facing these individuals and families. So probably most of what we do is online and it comes in the form of our blogs, in the forms of our position papers, and you can find all of that online at NCS Autism, so National Council Severe Autism .org. Um, and we um, also do um, a, a, a fair amount of education and outreach um, in different conferences, different um, symposia, trying to raise awareness of the challenges. Have you worked with other students with other disabilities? Well, for this group, we um, see a lot of uh, disabilities relating to intellectual disability, epilepsy. Um, what else? Um, often these families have, com these children or now adults, 
as well have comorbid um, medical conditions. So yeah, I would say that we, there's a lot of overlap among all of these disabilities. Another strong area that we see is mental health conditions. So often um, these uh, individuals are not only diagnosed with autism, they often also have comorbid mental illness, which often exacerbates the behavioral um, challenges and needs that they have. Thank you. Jill, could you tell us about some of the issues that the families who are involved uh, are facing? Yeah, so um, with a child or an adult with a severe form of autism, um, there are a number of issues that are really first and foremost um, to these families. You know, first of all, I think there's a really desperate need for better treatments that a lot of these um, children and adults have unfortunately destructive behaviors, aggressive behaviors, self-injurious behaviors, um, property destruction, often you know other things that are distressing like loud vocalizations, um, perseverations, and um, those are distressing not only for the individual affected but for you know the family and the people who who live with and care for this person. And unfortunately, um, you know the, the treatments available today are not. Uh, very um, effective mm -hmm. um, and often they have um, you know bad side effects um, you know that can that can harm you know the individual so I think that's first and foremost is to assist with the severe behaviors um, second of all I think you know the adult autism crisis is an urgent urgent issue because here's what we see happening in the field that as this population mm -hmm. of um, young adults ages, their parents are aging as well. And their parents, not that we won't live forever, but we won't live forever, <laughs> unfortunately. Even um, we should. We should live forever. We need a magic pill for that, Well, and uh, But what we see is that the parents become increasingly unable to care yes. for their high needs children. And this creates more pressure on the public services system to provide supports, programs, mm -hmm. medical care, and most of all, housing. And it's been, um, as we've seen these numbers grow and grow and grow and grow, the capacity in the communities, right, to respond to this need has not increased. So um, we see more and more families in crisis and desperate for long-term plans and services for their children. Now, this is a very huge issue. It's not an easy one that we can solve in a day or a mm -hmm. week or a month or a year. I think it's gonna take just consistent advocacy to clarify the scope of the need, the menu of possible solutions and then to start pushing those. And that's not an easy task. This is a national crisis. It's not just a California problem. Although in California, we're definitely experiencing it. Um, and I think we need to work, especially at the federal level, to effectuate reforms um, you know, to, to really help these individuals as they grow up and as they unfortunately lose their parents. Excellent. Would you say that this problem has existed in, in previous years and uh, generations and just is now getting more awareness? Or did you say it's, it's like a ma more major problem than it has been in past years? That's a great question and a really important question. Um, I want to say emphatically that the great weight of the evidence shows that this is a very real increase and in that it's not an artifact of shifting diagnostics, mm -hmm. expanding awareness, broadening of the category. I mean, I think that there is some of that and there's some research to suggest that. But I want to give you some examples. So in California, um, our developmental services system had about 2,000 autism cases in about 1980. That number is about 120,000 today. All right. 2,000 to 120,000. And this is does not include most of those with higher functioning forms of mm -hmm. autism. These people have to meet what are now more stringent criteria than existed mm -hmm. you know, in, in 1980. So we've seen this very alarming, very strong surge in autism cases. Um, we've seen an even larger surge in the education field where that 
diagnostics is where the diagnostics are a little bit broader, a little looser. Um, they've seen this in state after state after state. They've seen this in um, the federal, the, the mm -hmm. CDC studies. We're now seeing one in 40 children having a diagnosis of autism. There is nothing in previous generations, previous decades, to suggest that this was a case or that these children were diagnosed with something else, mm -hmm. right? And we've just shifted it to the autism category. We don't, we don't have that. We can't find these rates among our adults. So as I said, the great weight of evidence is that we've experienced an alarming and dramatic increase in very serious neurodevelopmental disability. Now, I want to say it's not caused by vaccines. People always say, oh, thank well, you. Yeah, it's not. I'm just so tired of this, you know, the zombie that won't die of the vaccine hypothesis. You know, we don't understand what's causing it. But I, I do think that we will come to uh, an increased understanding, um, you know, in, in a couple of years. Um, it is uh, genetic to an extent, but it's not fully genetic. Genetics right now only explains about 10% of autism cases. It might get up to about 20%. So there's a large unexplained portion. Mm -hmm. It's one of the great medical mysteries of, of the day. But, you know, at the end of the day, no matter what's causing it, we unequivocally have this social services crisis on our hands, unequivocally. So even if we shut our eyes to the biology, we have to deal with, with um, this problem we're seeing. Excellent. Thank you. I'm going to switch your hats now, Jill. Could you, excellent. Could you tell us a little bit about the Autism Society and the upcoming conference that you're going to be doing with it? Yes, I'd be delighted. So Autism Society San Francisco Bay Area has been around for more than 50 years. We're a nonprofit kind of based all around the Bay. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, we, uh, for the last six years, have been running the region's largest conference on adult autism programming and um, planning. So this conference is coming up, the next one, November 16th. It's a mm -hmm. Saturday at Stanford University at one of their medical school buildings. And in fact, we're partnering fully with um, Stanford Autism Center this year. They've been very, very helpful in planning this conference. This conference um, is just one day of incredibly intensive information delivery, basically. And our target audience is um, parents, caregivers, and professionals who help plan for and have responsibilities for adults with autism. Um, and so people ask me sometimes, well, wh why isn't your target audience adults mm -hmm. with autism themselves? And I think, well, that's a great thing. I really want conferences like that too, but we just have one day to deliver a lot of information. We're not able to do everything in one day. So um, I hope that we can help you know, with a SENS conference, for example, and, and other conferences like that as well, because that's also very important. So um, this has become a very popular conference. It sells out every year, and we really focus on very pragmatic mm -hmm. things. This is not a conference for like wild ideas and inspirational it, stories. I mean, yeah. this is a nuts and bolts, kind of boring stuff, but really important stuff conference. So I'll give you some of the examples, like how do you look for housing? Um, if you're creating a special needs trust for your special needs child, mm -hmm. what elements do you want to think about? If you're looking for public benefits, right, whether it's in-home support services, social security, um, you know, even food stamps, you know, what does that look like? How do you go about that? How do you maximize your access to public benefits? If you want to start saving money and do some financial planning, how do you start opening an account with CalABLE, if you know what the ABLE accounts mm -hmm. are, which enables people with um, disabilities to set aside money without sacrificing their eligibility for public benefits? Um, if you um, want to get job training, right? Where do you go? Uh, what are the programs that are out there? What are some of the skills that need to be developed? And how can you work with your child on developing those skills, not only for job acquisition, but job retention? Mm -hmm. What about those who aren't really capable of employment? What are the other options out there in the community for them for day programming? Um, what about um, if you're uh, a parent and you know you are planning for your own demise, right? How do you put in not just a special needs trust, but how do you put in a plan, right, for the long-term care of your child um, mm -hmm. after the parent is gone? 
and um, uh, you know many other things like that. We also have some stuff on developing social skills. Um, you know, uh, uh, some things on you know person-centered planning, which is a really important mm -hmm. um, principle for delivering uh, public services today. So um, it's a big, wide range, and we also cover the whole spectrum, right? So I just talked about right severe autism. Yes. Our Autism Society SF Bay Area Conference covers the entire spectrum from those who are very capable to those who have very, very um, severe issues. We're also talking about mental health in this mm -hmm. conference, for example, and even bringing in things like medical cannabis, right, which is something that a, a, a lot of families are, are using um, with their children. So it's all over the map, as we say, this is a conference with something for everyone. Excellent. And how can our viewers, both here in the Bay Area and beyond, find out more about it? Our website is sf, as in San Francisco, autismsociety.org. So sfautismsociety.org. And if you go to the homepage, there's mm -hmm. a place to click, and it'll take you to information about the conference. Now, I should say there are only about 20 tickets left. <laughs> Oh my. So, yeah, we're, we sold <laughs> faster this year than any other year. Um, but that said, we are going to endeavor to put as much information as we can on our website so people can access that for free at their at their leisure afterwards. Excellent. Well, thank you very much about that. Our cultural correspondent, Stacey Kennedy, has a question or two. Yeah, I understand there's a, a Nutcracker event um, happening within your um within the community so would you like to talk about that sure stacy yeah um so um a lot of our kids with autism and also some of our adults with autism mm -hmm. have a very hard time attending regular performances mm -hmm. whether it's ballet like the nutcracker or whether it's musical theater or yeah. something else because sometimes they just need to jump and move or mm -hmm. shout um, and uh, it's it just becomes, I've, I've had a lot of families, including mine, who are mm -hmm. escorted out of regular performances. Oh, yeah. So what we try to do, and we're following on the tails of a nonprofit that just closed called Autism Fun Bay Area, because they mm -hmm. pioneered this, mm -hmm. is we work with cultural groups around the Bay Area to create autism-friendly opportunities to see performances. Yes. And one of our favorite things is the Nutcracker. Mm -hmm. and for I think the last four or five years, we've partnered with several different regional companies um, to create these opportunities. And what we usually do is we take their dress rehearsal oh. and we turn that into an autism friendly performance. And that's kind of free, right? They're doing Sweet. the dress rehearsal anyway. <laughs> right. It doesn't cost them anything. Yeah. And we're able to bring in anywhere from like, you know, 50 to 200 people. And their kids get to see the Nutcracker and mm -hmm. they love it. They love it, including my own little special. Yeah, so this year, uh, we will have at least three of these opportunities. They're on, I hope they're already posted on the website. If they're not, they will be soon, sfautismsociety.org, uh -huh. under our events calendar. Um, one of them, um, we launched with San Francisco Ballet, which, as you know, is a very elite yeah. ballet company. They've created a special needs Nutcracker workshop. Oh, nice. And now yeah. we used to partner with them on that, but now they're kind of doing it on their own, which is uh -huh. awesome. I bet they're out of tickets, but it's there if anybody wants to check. Yeah. Um, we're also partnering with Los Gatos Ballet and Peninsula Ballet Theater, oh, yeah. and hopefully one more. Those will all be posted. And I think it's a very, very affordable, it's a sort of pay, you pay what you can, sure, kind of a small sure. donation. Oh, um, and yeah, the families absolutely love it. So I've actually been to some dress rehearsals. I mean, I've been in them myself, and they're actually quite fun, you know. And it, um, at one of them, I used to, it, it like someone forgot to raise the curtain, which it didn't matter because everyone was enjoying it. But the way the actor like portrayed and <laughs> just said. Can we have that up a bit, please? <laughs> you know, that's, that's funny. They I, I improvise. It's yeah. it's absolutely. I think that's absolutely fun for every person in the public <laughs> and a, and every person on the spectrum yeah. too. And yeah. I just think uh, that's a wonderful thing. Yeah. Thank you. You're yeah. welcome. Yeah. Uh, what are some of the social activities of the council? Right. Well, uh, this is for Autism Society San Francisco Bay Area, and we have been doing a lot of social activities. So our most popular one by far are our summer pool parties. 
So every summer we rent a pool. This has been in San Jose, but we'd love to do them over you know, around the bay um, for a Sunday where for three hours where families can come with their special needs children and adults and just enjoy a day at the pool. And this is an all behaviors are welcome event. So we sometimes have kids who can't, again, can't go to the regular pools, right? Or, um, you know, the, or the parents require, where they require so much hands-on um, supervision that it becomes very difficult for the parents. So these have been inc become incredibly popular pool parties. Mm -hmm. So we did seven of them this year. We'll do seven of them at least next year. And they're entirely free. Um, and not, we not only have the pool, but we have music, we have snacks. It's a great way for people to meet each other and for the, the kids to have a lot of fun. Um, and then we also have some networking events. We have a new series that we call Autism on Tap. And it is what it sounds like. It's at a bar. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, it's this, this series has been taking place in Mountain View. But again, we'd like to expand to other places around the Bay. Basically, we're in a pub. It's a, a bunch of tables, a beer. And it's almost like a big support group, not just for the parents. We've had plenty of adults with autism also join us so it's great people you just have to be over 21 that's all that's the only thing you can't go so if rose pretty soon your brother will be able to and uh, uh they're just lots of fun and they just talk about everything under the sun together um and uh we also are having a holiday party december 15th that's a sunday evening that will be posted on our website again for autism parents and and for adults with autism, again, 21 and up, um, that particular party. We also do things that are more educational in nature. We have a webinar series. Uh, those archives are posted on our website, linked from our homepage. Um, what else have we been doing? Uh, we've done other musical-oriented events, uh, recreational events. So we list our calendar on our website, and I think people should just take a look at that from time to time. Excellent. Thank you. Now we'll hear from our cultural correspondent, Stacey Kennedy. Thank you. So uh, <clears throat> some of the things I'd like to share today, uh, Saturday, November 16th at the Marin County Office of Education, there will be a continuous talk about girls on the spectrum where professionals, founders of support groups, doctors, language, excuse me, language pathologists, Fathers and grandfathers will join the discussion. Um, tickets are 25, but free for those with financial hardship. You're welcome to correct me on anything if I, this came from SF Society. Sure. Yeah. But um, Karen Kaplan, who um, panels I've spoken on before too, and my boyfriend and some others I, from Ascend, she's the person to contact at 415 Four nine seven three seven five one, or you can email her at uh, Karen Support Su at Comcast.net. Sunday, November twenty fourth. This was already brought up, but the uh, SF Ballet Sensory Friend Dance Workshop th that'll um, that'll be starting at three, and go to four thirty p.m. on November twenty fourth. And again, as mentioned, it's a um, <coughs> It's um, to experience an, a ballet performance participant and, and participate in guided um, movement classes that is specifically tailored to the sensory and behavioral needs. Uh, Saturday, December 7th is Ascend's annual holiday party and more details are to be determined. And as usual, you know, bring yourself and your holiday spirits and, and Will mentioned it already, but like um, Ascend had a 20 year anniversary, so congrats to Ascend on that. And um, you could read more detail on that on the Ascend website. Thank you. Well, thank you again very much, uh, Jill Escher. Uh, we're very glad to hear about the upcoming conference as well as the uh, work that the society is doing. And we wish both your endeavors and all the other hats that you wear the very best of luck. Thank you. And thank you too, Sophie. <laughs> well, that's our show for this week. First of all, I want to once again thank uh, Jill and Sophie Escher uh, for being our guests. And I'm Keith Halperin. I'm Will Burnick. I'm Jennifer Brooks. I'm Stacey <laughs> Kennedy.
This is Sophie Escher, and I'm Jill Escher. And until next time, uh, have a very happy Thanksgiving and a good holiday season, and uh, very best to you and yours. Take care. Thank you.